So greetings and good afternoon, everyone. I am Marcel Haddix, Dean's Professor and Chair of the Reading and Language Arts Department in the School of Education at Syracuse University. And I'm also Chair of the Douglas Bicklin Landscape of Urban Education Lecture Series. I want to thank everyone, each of you, for being here with us virtually and in spirit. I also want to thank Dean Joanna Massangila. I know you're out there for her support of this series and all of the individuals who shared in the planning for today's event and the team responsible for the logistics, promotion, tech support. Uh, that includes Angela Flanagan, Shannon Thibault, Allison DeVoe, and Jennifer Russo. Thank you all for your support. We are living through precarious times and learning to navigate the terrains of a significant public health crisis. This has meant that we are teaching and learning together in online and remote spaces. While 2020 has certainly presented challenges, we saw this as an opportunity to extend our landscape on urban education lecture series audience beyond those who are able to physically be with us in central New York and to use this platform as an invitation to those who are interested in and engaging with pertinent issues in urban education across the nation and even globally, especially our School of Education alumni. Just on the heels of our national election, we also felt it was important to have this public conversation on what leadership means today and what is the leadership that we need in this moment. And at the center of this conversation is the question of race and racism. What leadership means for people and communities of color and the impact of, on children and students and young people um, in our school communities. So we are grateful for the group of panelists that we were able to convene to have this very important and necessary dialogue. I want to thank each of you for accepting the invitation and being with us this afternoon. But I want to begin by first introducing our moderator, Dr. Sari Banks, who is the Dean of Students and Vice President for Student Affairs at Skidmore College. In her role at Skidmore, she is responsible for the academic and social progress of students, overseeing all offices and student affairs, including athletics, campus life and engagement, health and wellness, residential life, career development, student diversity programs, and student academic services. She is an alum of Syracuse University where she received a bachelor's degree in inclusive elementary and special education and both a master's and PhD in cultural foundations of education from the School of Education as well as a CAS in women's and gender studies from the College of Arts and Sciences. We could not think of a better person and a better leader, more effective and important leader to uh, lead and moderate this afternoon's conversation. So I'd like to hand it over to you, Siri. Thank you. All right, Marcel, thank you for that amazing introduction. I love that I'm getting ready to spend the end of my day doing what I love most, um, talking to my Syracuse family. So hey, y'all, hey. Um, but I don't wanna spend another minute on me. Um, we have pulled together an incredible panel of leaders um, and I want to jump right in. We will, they will do some introductions. We then have some questions that have been submitted to us um, that we'll go through before we move to the Q and A section. So at this moment, each panelist will give their name, their graduation year and program, where they work, in their title and offer just very brief remarks about how they just define leadership in this moment in time. And as I've learned to do in the Zoom world, I will call on them in the order that I see them on my screen. Okay. Um, Paul Buckley, you're first. Good afternoon. Uh, I thought for sure that I would not be first. <laughs> I said, you know, there, there are a lot of people on this panel who will first offer their remarks. Well, I am Paul Buckley, uh, PhD in Cultural Foundations of Education in 2012. And until January of this year, uh, I've, I've worked on a college or university campus um, for, for some 25 years. I now work uh, still for an academic institution 
focused on finding cures for cancer, infectious diseases, and other related diseases, uh, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington. Uh, there I am Vice President and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. Um, when I think about uh, leadership and leadership for this time, I think any good definition of or meaningful definition of leadership is going to retain that leadership retains its definition in all circumstances and times. Uh, today, I think we need bold, values-based, um, outcomes-focused leadership. And specifically in these times and in, in, in a post Breonna Taylor and post George Floyd era, um, if we are in fact in a post anything um, around what it means to continue to struggle for black lives in this country and in this COVID era, we certainly need leadership that is focused on recognizing, uh, protecting, and sharing in the full humanity of our colleagues, our students, our communities uh, that we belong to, um, as well as those um, affiliations that we don't share. Um, so this is a time for bold, straight up, anti-racist, anti-oppression leadership. Um, I think that has been the focus of black leadership in this country. And so in many ways, we are continuing our leadership um, with, I think, uh, even stronger energy today than yesterday. Thank you, thank, thank you Paul. Gayla? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gayla Hughley, and I'm really honored to be here. Um, I have um, lots of mentors here I'm on a, as panelists, and so I'm just so blessed and honored to be here. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I'm a recent graduate from Syracuse University, May 2020. I just graduated with my master's in teaching and curriculum with a focus in mathematics. And I am currently a middle grades mathematics teacher in the Syracuse City School District. This is my fourth year teaching. And I'm also a demonstration teacher for the uh, mathematics department, the, the entire district where I'm providing lots of videos and resources for teachers and students to use during this virtual learning time. Uh, for me, I am a strong believer in leadership being something that uh, really stems from empowering people around you to be the best versions of themselves, especially for me as a teacher. Uh, for me, I think it's important to be and model what it looks like to be authentically yourself. And when people see that, um, they're encouraged to have the, the courage to do so themselves. And so for me, it's really simple in terms of being that model for other people around you and students just specifically for me. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Thank you. Don. Um. Good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I begin, I want to give a heavenly shout out to one of my guardian angels, um, Dr. Sarah Bicklin. Um, I miss you and I thank you for all that you have done and poured into my life um, that allowed me to get to this space. Um, so I wanted to give her a very special shout out. Um, right now, um, I, I currently serve as the Vice President for Equity and Inclusion at Quinnipiac University here in Connecticut. Um, I'm also a tenured associate professor in the Department of Sociology, Criminal Justice and Anthropology. And so briefly in, in thinking about leadership, I've been thinking about what I've been focusing on over the past few months with the racial uprising and COVID, you know, leading through the midst of dual pandemics. And, and I've kind of been focusing on, you know, how do I protect my sanity, care for myself so I can be of service to others, um, moving beyond um, myself and understanding and how to care for the masses, the people who are looking up to me and depending on me. Um, and so I've been focusing on periods of radical self-care um, in order for me to be my full self, in order for me to be worthy. Um, well, I'm already well worthy in order for me to be of value to the people I'm serving and to the people that I'm leaving. And so I've been really focusing on um, my self-care during um, this leadership crisis moment. Thank you, Don, and thank you for the shout out to Sari. We all, many of us on here owe her so much, right, for where we are today. Kimberly? 
Oh, I think you're on mute. Not yet. No. We'll come back. Okay, Reba. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Reba Y. Hodge, and I'm currently an administrator in the Syracuse City School District. Before I get into that question, I do want to publicly acknowledge Dr. Marcel Haddix and the team, but particularly Marcel for creating this opportunity. I think it's so necessary to hear from folks who are in the field and doing the work on a daily basis. So I just want to thank you along with the School of Education at Syracuse University. I also want to thank the panelists and today's moderator for lending your time and voices to this conversation as well. I'm actually an alum twice over from Syracuse University. I received a bachelor's in inclusive elementary ed from Syracuse. And then more recently in 2016, I obtained my PhD from the School of Ed in its teaching and curriculum program. My leadership at this time continues to be focused on supporting and affirming students and working with teachers and staff to create in-person and remote spaces that are safe, thoughtful, and compassionate. Spaces in which students and their families feel as though they belong. In this time, I believe that we as leaders are must move beyond issuing statements that clearly demarcate who and what we believe in, but we must engage in the work of critiquing and dismantling white supremacy and all the ways it shows up in our schools and institutions. My leadership continues to think about and drive discussion and decision-making around equity and access, but also within the context of the times we are living in really promoting wellness um, amongst my educators and my teachers, because I want my teachers well. I want them to take care of themselves, not only because of their wellness, but because of what their wellness does for our children. Our children deserve well educators. And so that's kind of where my leadership sits at this point. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Kimberly. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, perfect. All right, sorry about that. Uh, Kimberly Williams Brown, I am a two time graduate of Syracuse University. I was um, a part of the communication and rhetorical studies program. I graduated in 2011 and then graduated from CFE in 2017 with my PhD. Also worked um, at Syracuse for eight years prior to transitioning into the PhD program. I'm currently an assistant professor at Vassar College. It's in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, I'm a professor of education and I have affiliations in Africana studies and women's and gender studies. Leadership to me um, means that one leads by courage and boldness and one has a moral com compass. So I believe that in this time, especially as a leader, you can't be wishy-washy or in the middle in terms of how you lead. You must be clear about what you believe and how it influences you. And when it comes to, um, uh, to the reach, one must understand what justice looks like and who it uh, includes and who it excludes. So for example, for me, I can't be a leader who uh, cares about black lives and anti-racism if I don't understand how uh, the lives of trans people and disabled people are also bound up with the liberation of black people. So to me, my leadership um, must be in intersectional as well as it's inclusive. It must also be de decolonial. And by that, I really mean um, really think about all the structures and systems, all the ways in which colonialism and other um, practices have silenced and marginalized groups so that in my leadership, um, I can begin to think broadly about what that means and to think about how all of our liberations are bound together. Beautifully said. Thank you, Kim. And Mr. Shaw. <laughs> Thanks, Siri. And again, I just want to echo um, Riva in um, thanking um, Marcel and um, everyone um, at the School of Ed for giving me this opportunity to come back um, and be sitting here um, 
on a panel of a program that I used to work on on the back end. So that's um, really quite amazing. I'm Tyrone Shaw and I graduated in 2012 with my undergrad, no, ooh, 2010 from undergrad at Syracuse in poli-sci and secondary education. And then in 2012 with a master's in CFE, Cultural Foundations of Education. I'm currently a high school teacher in Washington, DC. And when I think of leadership, I think about leadership always being exemplary. I really like what Dr. Buckley um, picked up about um, leadership being a constant when whatever time period it, it is. And for me, that's always having exemplary leaderships where leaders are setting the example for their um, people who they're working with and that's working for them, but also for the people who may come in and fill their shoes later on. So in my personal um, workspace, that's me setting that example for my students who I am working for, because I want them to see someone who looks like them in many different ways and be able to say, hey, I can also be that person. So it's setting that example for them to follow later on. And amongst my colleagues, it's about, you know, being the best teacher that I can be so that there's a model for that in the building and um, carrying that throughout any position that um, I hold. And also just like, you know, really stepping up in terms of taking leadership positions when they come our way. Cause I'll, I think a lot of time, especially people of color, we get that imposter syndrome where we're like, we're not supposed to be here, right? And so it's jumping into those leadership roles at times um, when people haven't filled those spaces that look like us and setting that example. Ooh, Tyrone, that was a call to action. That was a call to action on a tired afternoon, but thank you. Thank you all so much. So our very first question is, given the emboldened nature of anti-Blackness since the election of Donald Trump, has your leadership style changed? If so, how? If not, why not? You can just indicate to me if you'd like to answer that question by raising your hand. Kimberly? Sure, so I would say my leadership style hasn't really changed, but I think I spoke about being bold earlier and I think I've had to figure out how to be even bolder than I was before. Um, so for example, this summer, um, uh, the president of our college uh, engaged me in a conversation about a speech she was about to give about anti-racism. And as a junior faculty member, a black junior faculty member, right? feeling like, oh my gosh, like if it, it depends on what I say to her because I could say the wrong thing. And at the end, she's the one who decides my tenure case. And so thinking about all of that in my head, but knowing that it was a moment that I had to really let her know, right, what was up. So challenging her language, she was using language like white privilege. And I kept saying to her, what you're describing is not white privilege, what you're describing is white supremacy and you have to name it as such. What you wanna talk about is anti-racism and you want to name it as that. And it's not that she listened to everything I had to say. It's not that, that when the speech came out, it was perfect and or included anything I suggested, but it was about right um, being able in that moment to say, this is what needs to be said. Um, and for her to say to me, others have said this to me, I'm not quite ready to go there yet, but right, it seems like this is where I should be going. And so um, being able to, to do that in that moment is a way to think about how to be bold, right? Even when your, your, your um, uh, livelihood might be on the line. But I think in this moment, right, one has to figure out how to be bolder. And so, you know, if, if you've always been bold, how can you even push beyond that um, so that you are challenging people and not just their language, but also the way in which they see the world? Thank you. Tyrone, I saw your hand earlier. Um, I think Dr. Brown kicked us off wonderful there. And it's, for me, it was that day that we went back to school um, in 2016, when it was, was one of the hardest days I've ever had in the classroom, because I had all of these black and brown children staring back at me with fear, with so much uncertainty and I did not know what to say to comfort them or 
to make them feel like things would be okay because I didn't feel that way. And it was a moment that I realized that I needed to be more honest in terms of how I interacted with my students and the sort of face that I came in with every day. Um, Jeff Mangrum at Syracuse always talked to us about teachers having that poker face, right? And that I couldn't, I couldn't because I was so unsettled and they were so unsettled. And so I had to have a really frank conversation with them. And I think that turned me in terms of making me realize that, you know, leadership in that sense doesn't need to always be, and it can't and shouldn't necessarily always be neutral, right? Sometimes it has to be about values and sometimes it has to be about justice and sometimes it has to be about taking a stand. And I had a conversation with them where I had to explain like, yes, like, did I agree with the outcome? Not at all, but this is the system that we lived in. And I transitioned the conversation about that. And so, okay, so now many of you, like, you know, especially my seniors, I was like, you'll be able to vote the next time this happens. So how are you going to get involved? And so it was a lot of those difficult conversations that I realized that I had to become a lot more bold and intentional in the spaces that I was in with not just students, but with parents as well. Um, when talking to them to let them know where I stood in these times, because I, I, that, was, that became so much more important. Don? I, I think, you know, just briefly, one of the things, I, I'm not sure if my leadership style changed. One of the things that I noticed is that my filter that I use um, to not say everything or the first thing that comes to my mind was getting tried in a way that it hasn't been tried before. And so then I also had to balance that my filter was not becoming a mask that was preventing me from saying what needed to be said. Um, you know, if we think about the, the poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, when he talks about wearing the mask that grins and lies, it shades our cheeks and hides our eyes, you know, to, and he talks about with, with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile. Um, and so I had to, to balance, right? Thinking about what you talked about, Dr. Brown and, and that experience, you know, how do I name these things in this space and not necessarily be concerned with what the repercussions may be, but understanding that if I'm speaking truth and I'm doing it in, in, in a way um, that is needed at that moment in time, that that should be enough to protect me. And it's not necessarily always the case, um, but I really noticed the fact that my, my, my filter was being tried and some of the conversations that needed to be had needed to be direct um, and not sugarcoated. Um, and so I, I, I started to kind of focus on that um, a bit more. The other piece that was, was, try, that was trying for me in, in my leadership is, is dealing with, navigating dealing with my liberal white colleagues who meant well in this point in, in time in, in our country, specifically during the racial uprisings of this summer um, and really asking the questions of why now um, and not necessarily staying there, um, but that was something that really tried me as a person as I was leading through this, this moment um, of, of crisis on campus. Thank you. Thank you all for those comments. You've really talked a lot about sort of the social political context, these dual um, pandemics that we are dealing with as uh, Black people in our roles um, in, in trying to navigate our institutions. And we can come back to that a in a little while. Um, another question that was submitted to us was, has there been a policy change in your organization that was a move away from anti-Black racism uh, toward equity, what was the biggest hurdle you had to overcome to get to the end result? Uh oh, none of our institutions. <laughs> Don't make me say it so, out on the panel. Don. So, so one, one, one of the things that, that happened um, as a result of, of the summer um, people, if, if, if you remember, you, you know, everyone was putting out uh, Black Lives Matter on the, on, on the football field, putting it on helmets, putting it on the basketball court. Um, Ann Jemima 
lost her job and was taken off the pancake box. You know, all of these things, like they were, they were these symbolic um, gestures from, from corporate institutions um, and institutions of higher education. But if we dug deeper, we would see, you know, they would say that Black Lives Matter, but when we look at the leadership of those institutions and those organizations, it didn't necessarily show that Black Lives Matter in the ways in which they were practicing um, their hiring. I mean, so one of the things that we wanted to do at my institution is not to just do things that were symbolic. Um, and so one of the things that we came up with was our um, 10 point plan, which are our actions to improve racial justice. Um, and so we, in, we, 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 we implemented this, this 10 point plan that will help move us um, to do the work of anti-racism as an institution and to move beyond just the symbolism, but to actually put in things that we're gonna make concrete changes to our institutional structure and functioning and developing anti-racism as a practice, as an institution and not just because this is what the sexy thing is right now during this time. At our um, district level in Syracuse City, we um, adopted an anti-racist policy and just kind of going back off of what Don was saying, you no, know, there's been plenty of conversations, plenty of statements that leaders have made. But I think when we talk about really valuing black lives and black lives mattering, especially in our K-12 institutions, we need to be able to say that and really and truly embody what that means. And that means not having the majority of our black and brown students failing schools or being um, pushed out of schools. That means that our teachers are constantly and our staff are constantly critiquing and unpacking their own biases and actually engaging in learning and dismantling some of their learned ideas about our children. And so one of the things we did at Van Dyne is that I did start a justice collective over the summer, which has um, teachers and staff who are committed to becoming anti-racist educators. And that has just kind of um, broadened to other schools within the district, as well as to some of our schools in the suburbs. I think we have been very conscious of making decisions that don't just um, don't just support this idea of Black Lives Mattering, but that we're actually working towards making more just and more equitable decisions, calling for um, audits on our curriculum to make sure that our curriculum is what our students need and that they can see themselves in it. You know, asking our teachers to remember that they have voice, their own individual voice, but then also their collective voice and asking and demanding that their union step in and demand things that are impactful for our children and not just for them, to make sure that their union is working for our children as well and not just to protect teachers. So those are some of the things that I we've did over this last few months. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Kimberly. So um, the, the Vassar is a self-declared very liberal institution, but it doesn't like to come to reckon with itself around race. And so of course, when everything was happening this summer, there are different groups doing a variety of things um, to think about our racial history, but also to think about what the future could be. And so one of the things that Vassar was struggling with is that we, we found human remains um, from Native Americans in a building um, that a professor was keeping to do research, right? And one could point fingers at Vassar, but this happens all the time across many institutions. Um, but the way in which it came out, like there was just a lot of um, things that were very unsettling about how it happened. And so as everything was happening this summer, there's a group of us that came together to begin to think about what it would actually mean to practice decoloniality and to think about that at an institutional level. And one of the things that we've recommended since is um, doing cluster hires, which is not new, but to think about it um, from a decolonial perspective so that one, when we're hiring faculty, they're not 
coming in as um, just individuals, right? Or folks who just uh, people in siloed places doing uh, anti-racist work or doing um, work that is uh, dangerous in this time, right? Under a Trump presidency for sure. And to create cohorts and to have the institution be a place where people feel supported, right? Um, doing that work. And so as we um, put this proposal forward, while the dean and the president thought they were good ideas, the ways in which they really struggled, right? To think about how do we hold everybody else who's at this liberal institution and who thinks, right, that it's enough to just be, to have these ideals of liberalism without actually living them, right? How do you center um, decolonial practice? How do you center anti-racism as part of the institution was a real challenge. And so, I, you know, we're still in process in terms of thinking about what it might look like, but I think at least there's an attempt to begin to imagine what a world um, that, that looks decolonial in practice could be. And as, although it's really hard, um, I think people are, hopefully they're trying to step up to the plate. And so part of the leadership becomes about helping to guide that and to, to, to stay in process and to not get discouraged um, when folks kind of don't get it because sometimes they really just don't get it. Thank you. So someone um, early on in the chat, I'm gonna find the question asked, what do you all think about Linda Darling Hammond leading the ed education transition team for Biden, I'm assuming. She says she does not want to be secretary. And one of our questions was about that transition. What does the transition in leadership at the highest level mean for a new secretary of education? Tyrone? Um, well, as someone who is like here in DC and with our population in DC, I really am hoping that it's someone who is well informed in education practice as well as policy, because the practice part is usually missing from a lot of the overhead like policy that comes down. And it's like, okay, this is great, but how are we gonna implement this? And all the unfunded mandates, it's kind of like, okay, so we are lacking in a budget for all of these, you know, necessities in terms of having you know, school psychologist or a social worker, even a nurse, like how are we gonna also implement all of these other programs that first we're not addressing these like basic rudimentary issues of kids being able to come to school, having nutritious meals, you know, um, having access to technology at home and all of that. And I mean, one of the things about the pandemic, what it has done, it's brought so much of that to light because for us here in DCPS, I teach at a school where my students are super fortunate because it's a technology um, high, it's a high school, it's an application high school. We've been fortunate in getting a lot of the resources that some of my counterparts across the district haven't had and their students haven't had access to. And DCPS had to really come to a reckoning with that when the pandemic happened in terms of doling out resources. And I think a lot of the times, like my school gets used as a model, right? And they bring in all these people from the de um, Department of Ed to show off. And I'm like, hmm, highly problematic because this doesn't represent what's going on across the entire district. And I don't think those people oftentimes even have the practice side to ask the questions that say, hmm, this looks good on paper, the policy, great, but are you implementing this district-wide? How are you doing this? What does this look like for students across the board? So I really would love somebody who is well-versed in the practice side and the policy side taking over that role. I definitely agree with um, Tyrone. I you know, one of my main things was that let's just put someone there who believes in science. That was number one. And then it was a, you know, a teacher, someone who has practiced, someone who's been in the classroom, someone who knows policy, knows curriculum, 
but also someone who acknowledges and appreciates the impact of 400 plus years of racism and patriarchy and gender and equity and how those have really um, served to um, push students and push families and marginalize those folks in very specific ways. And so someone who's going to think comprehensively about what policies and organizational structures need to be in place to kind of mitigate some of that damage and that harm that's been done over time. Um, definitely someone who's going to promote equity and diversity, but not diversity just because, but diversity that is meaningful, diversity that in voice and, and ability and just making sure that we're hearing and listening to multiple stakeholders. Um, I think we also need someone in that position who understands the student debt crisis and, and is really intentional about looking at that and looking, up, looking at ways to really um, kind of give us some relief around that idea and, and that crisis of debt. So though, when I thought about that, that's what I thought about a teacher who actually believed in science, who can think critically and comprehensively and plan at a large scale to address a lot of systemic issues. Thank you. Gayla? Yeah, I just wanted to add on to what um, Tyrone and Eva just talked about. Um, when I'm thinking about this too, I'm thinking about somebody who is going to take action early with students at, from, from a very early age. And I say that because like, right now I'm experiencing a lot of what um, Tyrone mentioned where you know, students don't have that equal access to technology. But now that you know, there's been a greater push for a lot of students to have that equal access, I'm finding that it's not just that now they have the access, they have to also be able to, to have the knowledge and the skills to work those different devices and what have you. So because they haven't had those um, devices and experience with laptops and what have you from an early start, um, it's, it's hindering them even though now they have what they need. Um, and so it's so important for me to have someone in that leadership role who's going to not only acknowledge the fact that there's an equity, but attack it from an angle where it's being addressed as soon as students start their schooling so that that inequity piece doesn't start at all. Um, and so that's been something that's really woken me up since experiencing this transition in this time with my middle grade students um, who are using some of these devices for the first time. Sorry, thank you so much. Along those lines, how do leaders in schools plan to support students who may have slipped through some of the virtual cracks and that's at all levels of education? Considering the potential COVID slope, how are students who've been the most disadvantaged by this pandemic going to be supported academically and socially and emotionally in our schools? I want to be cognizant of my time and my responses. So I'm just giving people an opportunity to jump in if anyone who hasn't spoken wants to jump in. Mm -hmm. But no, I do have an answer for this <laughs> question. <laughs> um, I think when we think about the reasons we've witnessed and experienced students, quote unquote, across the nation slipping through cracks it's really not so much that there are these cracks. There have, there are, there's like a massive and extensive void um, that results in a lack of supports and services that are offered to our students. And so Gayla was just talking about this idea of the digital divide wasn't only about technology access, but it was also about uh, connectivity and ability to use technology in ways that our students hadn't been um, given the opportunity to use. So our students have had to navigate all of these pitfalls and part of our leadership has to be about minimizing the size of those pitfalls, but also about empowering 
our students and their families and equipping them with the things that they need to be successful and navigate. I think also this idea of the slope, the COVID slope, is really rooted in all of these issues around testing and what that means when we test again. And so I think what leaders really need to be asking for and demanding is that we move away from testing the way that we've been historically testing. Now is the opportunity, now is the time for us to say, we didn't do it last year, the world didn't crumble. Well, it didn't all the way crumble, right? It, we are still here. And so if we can really think about and imagine what assessing students can look like for the sake of learning what they need so that they can be successful people and not just successful test takers and not tied to money that comes into the district, but because we need them to have a robust um, vocabulary, a robust way of thinking, a critical way of thinking. So we want to make sure that our students are getting that because we want them to have big lives, not because we want them to have or do well on a state test. And I think if we start demanding that those, um, those demands get taken off of teachers, we'll see a lot more students engaged and teachers really working to, um, to really make sure that our students are learning and it's not just tied to testing. It's really authentic and really about what am I gonna do with the rest of my life? So that's what I think about that. Thank you. Um, and so I have one more question that's about leadership before we go into the um, more live Q&A. Um, and this one, I think everybody could probably take a stab at. I'm sure we've all had the experience. Someone's uh, um, asked, how do you recommend dealing with leadership that is not welcoming of concerns and suggestions from staff of color? to the point where when you actually do voice your concerns, opinions, experiences, you are basically told to stay quiet and or are treated differently afterwards. Paul Buckley. <laughs> you like doing that, Sari Banks. Um, <laughs> Oh my gosh, I've never experienced anything like that. It's so hard to find, <laughs> find a connection here. No, that's not true. I know that's not true. <laughs> I mean, is this America? Is this academia? Uh, you know, are the white people still here? Are some of the people of color who um, forgot who they are still here? Um, so I, you know, I really believe that, um, wow, I, 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 no one is going to silence me. I think, I think there's, so <laughs> I think for each of us, especially when we work um, at these schools, colleges, or universities <laughs> that are predominantly white or whatever they may be in their composition, um, I think it's really important for leaders to have a baseline about what they are going to um, navigate, what you're willing to navigate, not necessarily tolerate, but what you're willing to navigate and what you're not. And so, um, you know, uh, it, it has never been in my career journey from, I can, from the first position I held until now to be open to, um, <laughs> you're gonna sit down and, and shut up. That's, that's, that, is, that, that is not going to be me. It, it never will be me. I just can't do it, right? And so um, though my, my speech has been checked to be, to, be, uh, <laughs> to be transparent, my speech has been checked but for, 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 for me to raise an issue and it's like, be, be quiet, I, I, I don't think so. And so um, I wanna encourage that person to think about 
you know, what your baseline is around what you're willing to navigate with, um, I guess, leaders um, who are higher in the hierarchy, um, organizational hierarchy than you are. The other thing too is to, you know, I always like to talk about um, the power of community and how important it is when we're experiencing any kind of oppressive force to connect with our, um, with our community, um, to be in solidarity with others because um, your leadership may not be ready to respond to you as an individual, but perhaps they'll respond to you um, as one of several individuals who's bringing attention um, to, to an issue. And then, you know, uh, take the, the, the um, decide, decide, you know, <laughs> decide what you're willing to do and not do is that in, in regards to that. I, I always think that when people are trying to silence me, oh, more speech is always the best answer from my view. Okay, we can talk about it. I'm gonna tell everybody about what you said um, that you're trying to silence me. And um, that could go even more public than the organization, if you wish. And if the, the leadership cannot be responsive to that, then you have a choice to make. Um, and I think, you know, I know that's, I don't say that lightly, right? We're in jobs, we take jobs for a number of reasons. Um, and a baseline to that is, you know, we're, we're, we're receiving uh, compensation for our work so that we can eat, right? And we may have other, other mouths to feed, but you really, we really have to recognize um, our personal power in deciding to be in, a organiza in an organization where the leadership is toxic or to make a different choice um, and you don't have to go quietly either. Um, there are good ways to exit an organization and make it better as you leave for something better. That's what I would offer initially. <laughs> Kimberly? Thank you, Dr. Buckley. That was really well said. I, the only thing I'll add, because um, I was thinking about this too, is that in those situations, I think you always have to navigate it collectively and so not by yourself, right? Not singularly. And I was thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement as an example of that. Um, they often say that the leader, the, the, um, the movement is not leaderless, right? Or right, it's not, it's not leaderless, it is leaderful. And I really like that as a, as a mantra, right? So if you, if you think about that in your own personal life and you think about the ways that you navigate institutions, is that you navigate it with others. And, and I think in the collective, you're always, it's not that your voice is necessarily more powerful, but th there's a way in which, as, as, as Dr. Buckley said, right, um, the, it, it's harder for the institution to come for all of y'all. It's easier for them to come for one person. So to think about it in that way. Um, Don and then Tyrone. Um, what what uh, Kimberly and Paul just said reminded me of a time where it was in the School of Education where our elder um, Angela Davis was, 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 was a visiting professor and she, and she gave a seminar and talked about this collective and building community because she, you know, she said that you know, institutions don't fire communities, all right? And so they fire like the single person, right? That, that, that's out there. One of the other things that you know, I've had to do is to strategically navigate spaces with allies, right? People who are chosen allies, not the people who go out there and say that they're an ally and they are, you know, self-chosen, but the people who become my comrades, because, you know, there's certain times when certain things I'm going to say is going to be taken a certain way because of who I am, what I look like, right? And in and, and, and the body that I present. But then there are certain times when I need to lean on some other people to go out there and, and say it. So it's not necessarily just seen as always coming from me. So I think it's, it's about strategy. And it's not that you allow people to speak for you in all at all times, but I think one of the things I've learned is how to be strategic. And I return that favor um, for some colleagues in, in other ways where I'll say something that may be taken differently if I say it versus when, when they say it. And so I think it's, it's creating those types of partnerships in order to really bring about change in our institutions. Um, 
Don really just touched on something that I wanted to, that I'm gonna add on to. But first I just wanted to just acknowledge that I am really fortunate to work where I work and we have a lot, not enough, but a lot of forward thinking people here um, in the District of Columbia Public Schools. And so um, I have an arena that I work in that I can do a lot more than my, a lot of my counterparts. Whenever I go to workshops or seminars and I meet teachers from all over the country and I tell them some of the things that work that I engage in, especially like teaching my race class and gender course, they're like, what, how, what do parents say? And I'm like, what do you mean what they say? I'm telling them what I'm teaching, you know? Um, but I know that that's not the case everywhere. But I have had in my building though, pushback from other teachers where they are, you know, kind of nervous about that because they don't know how to have those conversations with those students when they bring it up, right? And once you give students, cause like, and I explained it to my colleagues where it's not, not that I'm like, I'm not encouraging the students to rebel. I'm encouraging them to politicize their experiences, right? So a student with a disability who I know who isn't getting their accommodation, I'm going to say, well, you need to remind this person that you, you are legally obligated to get X, Y, and Z, right? And to make sure that they're going to give it to you, right? So that teacher might get upset, but I'm like, that's your obligation there, right? And I want to do that with students, but in terms of something that Don brought up about that collective, I've had a lot of pushback from admin in some ways when I bring up issues of racial or gender justice, the way we talk to some of our young girls about their outfits, right? And I'm like, is this really a thing about their outfits or is it the thing about how you want to police their bodies, right? And so let's have those conversations. And a lot of the time, I can't have that conversation because the way Tyrone will say it is not necessarily the best way. So I go to one of my colleagues and I say, hey, you should bring this up at the staff meeting, right? And, it's, and it, it, it comes off better. And sometimes leadership listens differently to different people. And it's that um, idea that you, um, not everything needs to be said by me. And I'm not here because I wanna take credit. I'm here because I want institutions to change. And it doesn't need to be my voice doing that. There are other people who are well-to-do. So when we were having a lot of hard conversations in my building around race, um, this was what, oh my gosh, four years ago. Um, and, I did a workshop with one of my colleagues and it, it just, it turned into a, a whole topic and it came up at a staff meeting again. And some of my, you know, white coworkers who were well-meaning, I said, here's some points that you can bring up and raise to the collective, right? And believe it or not, it was received a lot better coming from them because it wasn't seen as like, oh, it was these people who are just disgruntled with the system who are, you know, speaking. So I think you have to find ways that you can affect change that it doesn't necessarily need to have your stamp on it all the time. And I think that's important to, for us, especially for our mental health at times too, to be like, okay, let me pass this on and let somebody else handle this too. And can, if I could just add on to what everyone has been saying, I, in my capacity as a, a building leader here, I work with wonderful teachers. And one of the things that I have been very um, intentional about doing is ensuring that we continue to cultivate a space that where our teachers know that they can come with any concerns. And so, when my teachers start coming to me and showing me like pictures or posters that have been purchased for our district that only have white faces on it. And they say, well, I'm not gonna put this up in my room because it's not responsive. It's not indicative of our um, student, um, our student population. I know that it's working. I know that what we are doing here is working. I think though, what we need to really 
focus on is how we at these higher levels can help to make sure that that kind of environment is not an exception, but that it is, it is the norm and it becomes what's constant across all schools and districts and across all institutions. So I, I, I agree with everyone and I just want to just say like we just need to continue to make sure like that we use our voice right because even though we're we're a marginalized group we're still at a level in leadership where we can um, we can use our our voice and our strategic maneuvering to make things better for those that are not in the same kind of predicaments or the same kind of circumstances that we are in. So I just wanted to offer that. And I, you know, I, these conversations are always so interesting to me because I, I haven't had that experience of anyone really intentionally trying to silence me or saying that I can't say this. And I don't know if I just didn't see it as that and I just moved around it in a different way. But it's always interesting to hear these very different perspectives and different experiences because then it highlights how much we still have to do to make things systemic and not just operating in pockets. It's so important that, that you say that and it's so true. Uh, you know, and even in our levels of leadership, um, there are things that we can do for each other. For example, there were things I didn't know you could ask for in your role as a, right, right? And it is okay for us to look at our compensation, our need for time off, our uh, the other benefits that come with the work we do, because we know the amount of labor that we put in our leadership roles, right? We are always, all of our conversations about supporting our students and being an example for our staff and pulling our allies along. And we forget sometimes that whether we're making a transition or we're asked to make a transition, you pe people get stuff. I remember when I first learned that, I was like, oh. <laughs> I understand. So I think, again, that collective as leaders is so important so that you know what to ask for. You know, for example, like I did, if you come into a job with a president that is going to leave in a very short period of time, you can ask for a terminal year so that if somebody new comes in and they want you to go, you can still have a year of to think about what it is you need to do. So it's those things that we also don't have access to, but that as we continue in these um, positions, we can support each other too, through. And I'm gonna go right to our Q&A and I'm trying to get questions both from the chat and from the question and answers uh, that are listed. So um, one of the questions is, what advice would you give to someone looking to go into administration about being an ally? Are we talking about college administration or, or school administration? It just says it, clarity around that. Yeah, it just says administration. So I imagine it could be it could be either one. Um, okay, well I'll just <laughs> I'll lean into that. And I saw a comment, uh, so I just want to point out that although I am brilliant. Um, it was Dr. Sawyer who talked about radical self-care. Um, he's also brilliant, um, <laughs> as all these panelists are. I, you know, I think, you know, it's it's been interesting that um, allyship has come up, and we've had this focus around leadership. And I think um, good leaders are allies. Um, you know, I think a failing of leadership is when you think it's about you, right? You think about, I'm amassing um, some organizational power and influence. I am, you know, I am now at this level. Um, good leaders are, are listening um, to the, the folks that they're supposed to lead um, and influence um, and the folks who are following them and responding to what they hear. 
uh, you know, earlier in the conversation, you talked about the Secretary of Education um, being good in, in policy and practice and someone who's listening, um, who is taught, someone who, who is listening to, to people who are literally in the trenches with students every day and then making a way for them to do that work um, with less boundaries and barriers. And I think very much um, that allyship and leadership is about listening to those you wish to be in allyship with and hearing them and responding to them and allowing them to, again, as, as uh, Don pointed out earlier, allowing them to name you an ally because of that listening and because of that courageous action that you take in alignment with what they're needing you to do uh, to move forward. Um, so I, I, you know, that's, that's how I think about going into administration or going into any level of leadership, um, however, it, in whatever context, um, that we have a responsibility to, uh, to be listening and we have a responsibility to be courageous and to act in ways that perhaps others cannot because of the, the organization, the situation, um, uh, our society, et cetera. We have a couple of uh, a follow-up question for you, Don, regarding that radical self-care. Um, can you talk more about how you practice radical self-care and how that has supported your leadership having more impact? Uh, so some of the things that I, that I chose to do is, one of the things is not watching videos of Black death um, anymore, um, when, when people are sending them, you know, on Facebook, Instagram, and all of these places, I, I don't, I don't watch that because I started to notice what that was doing to me. Like I started to notice my heart racing, my breathing, um, different, getting headaches and stuff like that, right? Because th that that trauma, the vicarious trauma, was real. So I, I cut that out so I can be a better version of myself. Um, one of the other things I decided not to do is to watch any of the election coverage. Right, I, I went, I voted, I did what I needed to do, and the rest of it was up. I just, I didn't want to bring that that on. I'll look at it later. Um, the other thing that that I do is I'm mindful of being zoomed out. Right, like we're on Zoom all of the time, and so if there are times when I don't need to be on camera, I make it my business to go out and walk while I'm on Zoom. I'll call in on the phone and get, you know, I can get like 3.2 miles in in that hour or something like that when when I'm walking. I'm um, taking my health um, seriously, right? I was trying not to put on any weight during this quarantine. Um, so I think those things have benefited me, but I also, you know, work with the people who are supervised and give them grace, right? And understanding that I can't expect things of them in this COVID climate in the same way that I expected them, you know, prior to COVID, right? Um, one of the things that has stressed us out is that like we're holding ourselves to the same level of, of, of requirements and responsibilities as if we are not in the midst of a pandemic. And so I, I, I try and work with my staff and ensure that they are taking radical self-care, right? I don't, don't be emailing me at 11 p.m. Um, not because I won't respond, but because you don't need to be up emailing me at 11 p.m. Um, and so it's not only practicing it for me, but also I think someone on here talked about the ways in which we have to model it, right? Modeling that behavior for my staff to take time. Um, you know, before COVID, I required, you know, the staff, everyone an hour per week or however, that if you're in the office, you close your door, you can meditate, you can do whatever, you can read a book, but not to be doing work because you have to take care of yourself if you're going to be effective in doing your job. And so that's something that I've tried to do for myself and hopefully um, inspire my staff to do the same. Thank you. Could I add on to this? Yes. Um, because, because I really, I love this. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Banks, you and I have had a lot, of, we've had many conversations around this. Um, there's a way in which, um, <laughs> you know, maybe because of our particular history in this country and in the world, you know, Black folks, we work hard. It's just, it's just a fact. <laughs> we work very, very hard. And organizations, institutions have a way of understanding that really well and getting so much labor out of us 
um, uh, I, 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 you know, I know of very few, I don't know of any uh, uh, black colleague in higher education that really isn't doing more than one job. They're not, they don't have two titles. <laughs> they have one title, but they're doing more than that one job. And so there's, I think one of the things we, we need to work on is normalizing this radical self-care. That, that like Baldwin, we say, I am not your Negro. And that's the kind way of saying, I am not your Negro. And I've got to take care of myself. I am not the help in this, in this institution. And the demands for us to be like the help where, and by that, I mean, we're always working and our particular needs, our family needs take They, they, they take second place or we're, we're finding ourselves always responding to that question of what takes first place. And I do think it's unique to our experience. I'm not saying others don't have uh, moments in their career where they, where they do that. I think that is so regular for black folks and we need to normalize and appreciate and uh, boldly take actions that put us, our families, and our communities first. And I think we would have made progress when we are not the bosses who are giving to, uh, who are normalizing this for our staffs, but when others who do not identify within our communities who are in positions of power are asking us the kinds of questions and nudging us to take time off, to take care of ourselves, right? To manage um, one job, even though we do five so well, but one job, right? I think that needs to be a direction that we go. And I'm encouraging folks who are not black, who are listening to this, watching this, to really take that under careful consideration. May I add something? Yes. I, and I, as you were talking, um, Dr. Buckley, I was also thinking about the ways in which it's so important for me to name what I'm doing as my self-care. So it makes space for others, right? To begin to realize that we, we like, this is normal. So for example, I am all about saying, yep, yep, I go to church and I pray. That's a part of my self-care because that's important to me. I also go to therapy. That's a part of my self-care. That's important to me right? All of these things that are taboo and especially in spaces of higher education, right? Like making them very normal, I think really allows then other people to realize that even if that's not your form of self-care, whatever it is that makes you feel well, those are the things that you need to practice, right? Making time to get up and go to the gym at 6 a.m., right? Like that is important to me. And so that's what I do or going at 12 o'clock in the middle of the day, because that's when I want to go. All of these ways in which I think it's really important to create a space as leaders so other people know. So naming things um, strategically so people know that they can also access those kinds of things. Anyone else on this self-care self question? We're gonna to move to another topic based on some of the quest submitted questions. If I could just add one thing around self-care and it's just remembering to find joy, locate joy in different things in different ways and any ways that you, you know, even if you think like right now, I'm, um, I'm in the midst of like, um, taking pictures of my fashion because that brings me joy. And for a long time, I wouldn't do that because I felt like I wouldn't be taken serious as an educator because on this side, here I am because I like shoes and bags, you know? And so um, I've been really intentional now after speaking to a friend of mine who really in our conversation said, Reba, you have to remember to find joy in all aspects. Like even if it's just one little moment in your day, find it and as Dr. Brown said, name it so that you can revisit it and it can be something else for others to follow as well. So I, I do think that 
the piece about joy is so important because we don't often remember that we need joy to be full and be our best selves. Thank you so much there for all of us. We have a number of questions that focus on race and racism taught in predominantly white schools and educating young black children about the importance of black lives and how to deal with their skin color um, being seen as a weapon. Do you have any comments about that, about what advice you have um, around educating around racism in schools? Hi, Roan. Um, as because I do a lot of work in this space in my school, one of the first things I just want to remind everybody in this audience is the, and yes, it's important that we do this, you know, um, for our white students too, but it's so important that we teach this to our black and brown children. It is so important that we politicize, we teach them how to politicize their experiences because so many times a lot of the frustration is that students are experiencing these things. They're living it, but they don't have the language to access expressing it to people, what is happening to them. And I'll give you an example. Um, in my um, global perspective course, which is where I, um, I do um, race, class, and gender, whenever we talk <clears throat> about the experiences of women, for example, the girls in the room are always kind of like, oh my gosh, we talk about women in the double bind. And they're like, oh my gosh, this has happened to me so much time. And I tried to explain it. I didn't know how. I didn't know there was a term for it, right? And it is so crucial that we do this for our kids too, right? Because they need to know what it is that they're going through and they need to know that they're not alone going through it, right? It's not a singular thing that's happening to them. We need to teach them how to recognize and call out systemic practices, right? That adversely affect them and know how to challenge it and address it wherever they are. So that's one of the first things I want to put out there because when I started doing this work and a lot of my colleagues who are people of color, they're like, why are you teaching this stuff? Like, why, you know, and, and they didn't realize how important that is for our kids to know that and have access to that language and how powerful that can be for our kids. And I think it's important that we do it as much in our schools that are predominantly black and um, people of color and also in schools that are predominantly white as well. And that work looks different, right? Because a lot of times for our kids, it's about empowering them to say, you and who you are is important and you're valued, right? within the system that tries to tell you that you're not. And the other side of it, right, is about teaching other children that they need to respect, right, and value other people who are different from them. What advice would you have for new teachers to support and become leaders who are fighting white supremacy? <clears throat> Uh, for new leaders I, or new teachers, I think one of the most important things you can do is to find a support group of other individuals who are around you that can continue to encourage you because white supremacy and white toxicity is unrelenting. And so you have to have that same kind of energy. You have to meet it with the same energy and you only can endure so much alone. So that's the first thing I would say is to really cultivate a group around yourself that pours into you and that reminds you of why you're doing what you're doing, why you're taking the position that you're taking. I think also you need to 
um, have conversations with leaders in schools that are committed to the same things that you're committed to. I think part of what sometimes happens is that there aren't enough conversations being had and therefore people just really don't know where people stand and where they position themselves. And once we start having those conversations on a consistent basis, I, I feel like that kind of community starts to really evolve and become a strong voice in a school system. Uh, a third thing I would recommend for uh, teachers is to become really well-versed in what you're talking about. Um, read as much as you can, have conversations and discussions that push your thinking and push you to the next level so that when you are in spaces where your voice needs to be heard, you're confident in what you're saying. So I think those three things are good starting points for teachers who are committed or who are committing to become anti-racist teachers and those are who are committed to become co-conspirators and just really positioning themselves as the, as the teachers that we need in our schools that then become teacher leaders. And I think you have to see yourself as a leader. I think for a lot of our teachers, I don't know what happened. I, I can't talk about exactly where it happens in teacher prep programs, but sometimes our teachers feel as though they come out saying, I'm just a teacher. You're so much more, you know, and I think we need to continue to um, impart that to our teachers who are coming into the profession. I mean, Gayla, did you see your hand, Gayla? No? No? Okay. <laughs> Um, so uh, uh, another question, in a world, more specifically a country, that is so overwhelmed by fake news and misinformation, how do you teach your students about the misinformation that is so present on every topic, but especially surrounding social justice movements? Um, but I, mean, I think it's important. Uh, I mean, I, I work with with college students, and one of the things that I that I've noticed, and some of you may have noticed this, is that sometimes students will say, "Well, that's just my opinion," right to end the conversation. Like, "Well, your opinion doesn't matter in this classroom," um, and not to sound harsh, but like your opinion only matters when you can support it, like with evidence that you research to be able to justify for you to stand on that opinion. And saying that it's my opinion is not a way for you to kind of just end a conversation. And then I also implement one of the strategies that Sarah Bicklin taught me is get students to understand explication before critique, right? Like, can you explicate the argument that you're saying that you are against um, or that you are for? Can you, can you explicate? And then we go into critique. And so I try and create a space where we get students to understand that just because you believe it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Um, and so it, it's, it, it's a classroom space where research is fundamental um, and challenging viewpoints is also fundamental in creating a space where I challenge them in a supportive environment. Um, those are some of the tactics that I use in the classroom. Next question, could everyone talk about how you establish spaces for faculty or staff of color to come together to build those shared resources? Where I am, we started a faculty women of color initiative, yet it is hard to get the community going with everyone's hands so full. How do you bring people together? 
um, if I may, I think one of the best lessons that I've learned is that you just show up, right? And you don't concern yourself with how many other people show up. So if today it's two people, then the two of you start working in solidarity with each other, and then you build from that. I think sometimes what gets in our way is that we feel as though we have to have everyone on board right at the beginning. And if we don't have that, then we are not going to do anything. And so what I would say is you just start, you just reach out and you just start. And one of the ways that I've done that here is by really, for my teachers of um, my black women teachers, particularly when we work in our collective, I have specific things that the black women educators have to do and that the non-black educators have to do. So I'm very intentional and very clear about there's going to be space that is just for this group of people and that is okay. And you all have to be okay with that and understand that that that's just how it is. But I think the main thing is that you just start. You don't wait for a hundred people. You don't wait for 10 people. If it's just you and somebody else, you start. And, and that's how you build. And, that's, and that is what I would recommend as one of those first things you should do. One of the hardest jobs on a great panel like this is keeping every keeping us on time. Um, we have come to the end of time for our question and answers, and there are so many more. So I hope those of you who didn't get questions answered will reach out to folks on the panel um, and just continue the conversation. But we wanted to leave the last couple of minutes for each of the panelists for any final thoughts, um, lessons learned, and maybe speak briefly to where, um, as Black leaders, we go from here. I can call on you as I see you on my screen. We'll start with Dr. Buckley. <laughs> we'll move to Gayla. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, I just like to end by talking a little bit about one of the major things that I've learned in this time of everything going on. And um, as an educator, one of the biggest things I've learned is the idea of flexibility um, and to embrace new ideas, new programs, new whatever it is, in order to empower people around you, uh, you have to be willing to try new things because they, they're going to see you trying those new things. And so, um, and all the different um, experiences that I've had over the last um, few months with the changes to virtual learning and with the ways we needed to support our students socially and emotionally, I've learned that it, that piece of supporting them in their social emotional health does come first. Um, and that's been very difficult for, I think, a lot of people to kind of accept, especially with everything going on, but that has to come first. Um, and in doing so, you're going to learn and grow more as an educator and as a leader. Um, and in terms of moving forward uh, and what changes that I might make as a, as a leader, as a, as a teacher, um, I really hold fast to something my mom always tells me, which is to stay ready so you don't have to get ready to be ready. And that is just so important to me because right now is a time where you need to be prepared for those types of changes and to adjust and adapt accordingly. Um, and so in terms of moving forward, stay ready, keep, keep the fight and, and keep going. Thanks so much for having me. Love that, Don. Paul, oh, messing up the order. Um, so first of all, I want to give a give a shout out to uh, one of my colleagues, Krista Gray, who's on here, who's doing her dissertation. Keep writing. Um, is it, is going to be there? Just keep writing. Um, stay stay empowered. Um, we see you. Um, and so I also wanted to end by one of the questions that someone I saw someone ask, I think the name is Christian Contreras, and, and they asked a question about how do we remain accountable to our ideological grounding and to the populations of which we, we've come from? And I think I want to end on, on, on that. And so one of the things that 
I, I, the way that I stay grounded is by connecting with the people. Um, the people have a way of humbling you in, in, in any point in time if you feel that you are getting too lofty. And so Harlem um, is my grounding space. And so I can't always get back to Harlem. And so Connecticut has you know, become my community. Um, and one of the things that I believe is that you know, people are the experts of their own reality. And so in, in the work that I do, I always try and make sure that it's done within community. Um, and I always stay grounded to the idea that I do research for and with and not on communities. Um, and so, you know, that, that's how I remain grounded. I understand that I'm here in the position that I'm in because I stand on the shoulders and I walk in the path that was blazed by people who came before me. I understand that the work that I do and that the degrees that I have received are not just my degrees, that I have a community of people who are looking up to me um, and who are pulling and pushing um, behind me. And so this work is not just for me. And so those are some of the things that I think about um, to, to keep me grounded um, in this space, and because I think it's as you start to navigate and get you know higher up in the institution, being on the president's cabinet, there's not a lot of people who look like me, and so some people will see that as as success, but sometimes it gets lonely um, being in in that space. And the place where, as you know, Reba talked about, and finding my joy, I find my joy with 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 the people, right? Like with with my people going back and walking on 125th Street wearing some J's and a fitted hat and just listening to the, to the sounds of the place. I mean, so those are the things that, that keep me going, um, that keep me grounded um, and keep me committed to the people who supported me along this journey. And I make sure that a lot of the projects that I do are in support of the communities that have supported me along the way. Um, and so that's how I stay grounded. Um, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Kimberly. I think um, I'm thinking about as I leave this conversation, just how my soul feels very full, uh, just being in conversation with all of you. So thank you for having me as part of the panel, but I just learned a lot um, from all of you. And so I'm really thankful for that. I'm also thinking about the ways in which the kind of changes that we need to make um, often requires that we change ourselves or we think differently about how we do things. I remember my one of the, the first position I had, um, professional position I had, uh, the Dean of Students said um, to all of us that when you're in a new community or when you're in any community, it's you have to understand and learn that community. I don't think I've always done that, but I think um, since I've been here, I've been trying really, really hard um, to do that and to think about it in a different way. Where I am currently, it's a very red district, very, very red, which is fine. And so what does that mean, right, for me to go into the community and work with the teachers who are here? and get to know other folks. What does it mean to be in community with folks who are in my church? And so to really understand what the community is, um, who's in the community so that you can do really good work as part of the community. I'm also thinking about, um, there's a, a, a paper that Dr. Haddix and I have coming out um, hopefully soon about um, teachers of color and we've interviewed them at Syracuse and the kinds of responses they give to us. And one of the things that I think about constantly from that is that they were so clear that our curriculums need to change in terms of how we do teacher prep, that we have to figure out a better way to teach curriculum. So we talk about being anti or um, anti-black racism and um, thinking about ways to, to, to not be racist, right? But our curriculums are racist. We haven't changed them in too long. In never. And so how do we position them and shift them differently so that our teachers coming out, right, have a very different focus on the world. They don't just take the one or two um, diversity courses as the requirement, but that in fact, their whole education is politicized. A lot of what you said, um, Tyrone, really resonated with me in terms of politicizing um, everyone, right, uh, black and brown students, but certainly um, white, white students as part of that. And I think Lastly, um, what I'll say is that I, we just have to keep doing the good fight. Um, I loved what you said, Reba, in terms of showing up, um, even if it's one or two of you, and just continuing to do the work, right? One day it might be 100. It may never be 100. But what does it mean for us to just stay in it and to continue to do the work and to find community and to find the people who want to do it with us and to have more spaces like the one that we had today? So thank you again. Thank you, Reba. You're on mute. Sorry, my final thoughts. Um, 
is just to really think about what these two dual crises have um, provided, right? So they've 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 highlighted a lot of disparity. They've shown a lot of different truths that people wanted to keep hidden. But working in a school building with COVID and the racial unrest and uprising that was happening has really afforded me to, an opportunity. So that's something that I keep stressing to my, my staff and my teachers. How can we take this circumstance and use it as an opportunity to think about and do something differently and do it better. And so that's what I would offer, this idea of using any circumstance to create a new opportunity that can create a different reality for our, ch our children and their families. I think that's what I would offer. Thank you, Tyrone. Again, I just wanted to first say thank you again for having me on this panel. I had a little bit of imposter syndrome at the beginning. <laughs> um, so, um, but it was so many of the things that I've heard here today, some of the things I need to start working on done. I'm, I need to start the self-care, I have not. So I, it's, that's so crucial. And um, so thank you for that. And so many of the points that were made here today resonate with, a lot of the work that we still need to do. But my thing that I would leave is a book recommendation, especially if there are any secondary teachers on this, um, uh, in the audience who are listening. Um, it's a book, it's called The Political Classroom by Diana Hess and um, Paula McAvoy. And it is so crucial. I know I keep repeating that phrase of politicizing our spaces, right? But it's so crucial that we continue to do that work in our classrooms, right? They should not be neutral spaces, right? They're, by definition, whatever you're doing in your classroom is political. Make it critical, right? Make sure your students are asking questions and are able to garner information and analyze that information and make sense of it, connect it back to their lives, their experiences, right? Give students a space where you validate their experiences and who they are, because I think that is so crucial and so important for the work that we need to do in order to make things change, and in order to affect the change that we really want it starts in our classrooms, especially those of us in the secondary elementary realm, right? I think that we um, are sort of like, you know, the vanguard there to like do that work. And it's so crucial we start that work earlier on with our students and that way we set them up for the future. Thank you. Paul? Thank you, Dr. Banks. Um, I, I, I add my thanks to everyone else. This has been a wonderful opportunity to connect with folks um, on this panel and to, uh, and to be a part of this process. Um, I, I, I have three, three thoughts. One is um, as leaders um, that we recognize that we are, we are leaders of generations, uh, literally. Um, and I was reflecting on the fact of, uh, of me being a, a first, first generation college graduate, but it's more than that, or, or being a, a black leader, um, where we, <laughs> we have an understanding that what we do really matters um, for generations, just as the leaders who came before us um, paved the way. Um, the, the second is, um, that the moment we're in is not a crisis moment, but is a part of the ongoing struggle for justice in this country, right? And so uh, it is really important that our responsiveness um, to this particular moment, um, uh, our, our initiatives, our efforts, um, that we go about them in ways that can be sustained um, for as, as long as possible because we still have, have a lot of work to do. And it, it, it occurred to me that one of the things that we should say is, you know, in this moment, in terms of, of the education that we're providing, 
at any level of education if it doesn't have a justice center i don't even know what i don't even know <laughs> what are we doing um this is a moment that calls our attention to really emphasize that kind of education um, so our policies practices but but our everyday learning that we're engaging uh, students in should be justice centered and i hope that this moment also uh uh, uh, charges us um, uh, to move from a, a, a white centric um, education or learning at, at any level of education and really places black indigenous people of color in the center. Um, and we do that work going forward. And finally, um, uh, that we all believe, continue to believe uh, in, in, in the righteousness and the power of of the work that we're doing, the righteousness and the power of the struggle that we are waging, because I, that is that is the fact, right? And so often we are minoritized and positioned to think of ourselves as less powerful, but because of what we stand for, we in fact are more powerful. And so, you know, the arc of the universe may take a long time to bend. <laughs> but it will bend and it should bend with our efforts as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for this joyful and uplifting 90 minutes of conversation. Allison and Shannon, Angela, who am I missing? Jennifer. Jennifer, she went away um, for your work uh, to do this. Marcel, beautiful and brilliant as always. And thank you for pulling us all together. And to all of the panelists, those I know, those I didn't get to know until just now, we are family now. Keep doing what you're doing. Let's lean on each other. Your work will continually um, continue to favorably change the world, both um, at the places where you are in education and beyond. Thank you very much. And Siri, thank you so much for moderating and, and just helping to uh, move the conversation and to try to get to as many of the questions and comments, both in the Q&A and in the chat. I just wanna let those of you um, who are watching know that yes, this was recorded and we will archive it. We will also save the chat and the questions because our hope with the Landscape on Urban Education lecture series is that this is an ongoing dialogue and conversation. So I know there will be ways for us to, to come back to it. And I also just wanna say again, thank you to the panelists. I am grateful, I'm so inspired by the conversation I'm grateful for the work that you are doing in your communities. Um, and I feel fortunate that I've been able to one, know you and to work with some of you really closely over the years. So um, it's just been a treat. And seeing some of the alum and folks who have been in the chat, um, thank you all so much for coming and spending time with us uh, this afternoon, this evening. And then one last announcement that I'll make um, before we all sign off is that we are planning for February 19th and 20th a uh, co-sponsored event, a symposium on race, policing, and justice um, through the, it's a co-sponsored event with the Landscape on Urban Education, the Linder Center for Social Justice, and the Center for Di Disability and Inclusion. So um, please just follow us uh, via social media, be on the lookout for information on the School of Ed website about that event in 2021. Uh, so we'll close it out. Everyone stay safe. Um, definitely take heed to the self-care and the wellness advice that many of the panelists shared and continue to, to do the work and know that it is important, um, it is needed and it is impacting change. Thank you all so much for being a part of this afternoon's panel. Thank you. Thank you.